Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Hey guys, just watching a uh, nature documentary here. I'm not sure how much I'm going to get into, but they're getting into the Channel Islands, and I think they go to Cornwall as well. Um, maybe even a bit of Ireland. So let's go. That's that's all we're doing here. My name's Connor. If you're new, original link to the video, top of the description. Um, let's go from Real Wild. Let's go. Let's relax and learn. Jersey's curiosity lives on San Bernard Beach. It hides amongst the thick growth of gorse and grass. It's a green lizard. The male is stunning and has a light blue neck and a bright green body. Such great colors on the face. The female is just as impressive with cream stripes along her body. The green lizard is one of Europe's largest lizards and can grow up to 40 centimeters in length. After the ice melted at the end of the last ice age and before the sea levels rose, Pickups. Jersey was the last channel island to be isolated by the sea. That's why the green lizard is found only here and mainland Europe and not on any other channel island or on the British Isles or Ireland. It didn't have enough time to colonize further west before the rising Atlantic flooded. Another island speciality is found on the island of Alderney, and it's active at night. It's a blonde hedgehog. Hedgehog. Hedgehogs on mainland Europe are usually brown. Maybe one of the cutest animals. But the Alderney population have a genetic makeup that gives them a blonde color. Hedgehogs became extinct on the island around the time of World War I. They were an important source of food at the time, and too many were taken. They were reintroduced around 50 years ago, and by chance, a large proportion of the released hedgehogs carried a white color in their genes. As a result, most of the hedgehogs on Alderney are white. The Channel Islands and northern France mark a boundary where, further north, the Atlantic coast becomes much cooler and wetter. It also marks a point where some wildlife species start their distribution range. Gannets are only found in the North Atlantic Ocean. 3,000 pairs nest on Les Etac Rock next to Alderney. Apart from one nesting location, a short distance south in France, all other gannet colonies are found further north, particularly on the British Isles. Across the English Channel, in Cornwall, on the southwest coast of Britain, you'll find another species that prefers the North Atlantic coast. Female grey seals have come to shore to give birth to their young. They always choose stony beaches, which are remote and where humans cannot reach. Are there great white sharks here, or like what predator? That there's, I'm sure there's orcas, but I'm not sure of any other shark that could really take down a seal other than a great white. I mean, there are tiger sharks and bull sharks, but I think those are more warm weather, more warm water species of shark. So I'm guessing the orca is their only big fear. They also look for large beaches where a dry area can be found, even when the tide is in. Here's a young calf, tucked in on one of those areas. After about five weeks, the mother leaves them, and the calves have to venture into the sea on their own. These older calves have lost their white fur that kept them warm on land and are now able to enter the sea. They'll learn to fish alone, and most of them will survive. 
Once the Water females give birth, they're ready to mate again. Close to the shore, Nail. bulls are eagerly waiting for them. You can just tell by his face. When the females return to the sea, the males immediately approach them and attempt to mate. They mate in water? Grey seals rarely live further south than Britain. They are true creatures of the North Atlantic and live on both sides of the ocean, both in North America and Northern Europe. Cornwall is the most southwesterly region of mainland. I really want to know what it feels like to have blubber or and be in really cold water. You know, like does it feel just like having a a jacket would be to us? It's just so strange seeing animals like with no obviously no clothing, um, just so comfortable in really cold water. And I I just wonder what that would feel like in Britain. I, I'm assuming it would feel a lot like how we feel when we're in a warmer water, but. but... Cornwall is the most southwesterly region of mainland Britain. It's a peninsula with dramatic, often inaccessible coastline. For centuries, the region was a mining area for tin, mm -hmm. copper, and arsenic. And old mine buildings are scattered along the coast. The cliffs though perilous to people, are safe places for birds to roost and nest. Out of bird poop. This rock is a favored place for these shags. They're a common coastal bird oh. and can dive up to 45 meters to catch fish. Shagging shags. The wildlife along the English you. coast is typical of temperate northern Europe. Eagle. The land above the cliffs is damp, not too wet, and reasonably warm. There are plants like Bloody Crane's Bill, a common plant throughout Europe. Beautiful. Dropwort also grows on the slopes. It's the month of May, and the small pearl-bordered fritillary is flying. Also the small copper butterfly. Both are found throughout Europe. This white throat has just arrived from south of the Sahara to set up his territory on a patch of heath. He's declaring his spot with a scratchy song. Birds are awesome. It may not be a beautiful song, but it'll deter other males and attract a female to nest with him under the bush. I don't hate on his song, man. Really? Around 45 kilometers to the southwest of Cornwall, you'll find the Isles of Scilly. They're an archipelago of five large islands surrounded by islets and rocky outcrops. Because the islands are far offshore, they're important stopping places for migrating birds. They're a place to land, rest, and feed before continuing on the next part of their journey. Surprised it's so inhabited by people. That's why I was just kind of shocked. But I, I think I've seen a, a different video about Skilly, Isles of Skilly, and yeah, I think it said that. This is a blue throat. It's October, and it's on its way south from mainland Europe or Scandinavia. He's heading for Northern Africa in search of better winter weather. Quite often during the migration season, lost American birds land on the Isles of Scilly. Having taken a wrong turn on their migration flights from North to South America, they've crossed the Atlantic by mistake. This accident. is one of them, a pectoral sandpiper. So is it doomed? Or... It's flown 5,000 kilometers across the ocean before reaching the first piece of land. And it's found St. Agnes Island in the Isles of Scilly. 
It'll be very hungry. In the center of St. Mary's Island, there's another lost bird. For obvious reasons, it's called a lesser yellow legs. It's extremely tired after its long journey. And here's another one, an upland sandpiper. Like the others, it nests in North America and usually migrates to South America during winter. This time it's been carried off course by the Atlantic winds. Just a little, a little off course. We don't know exactly what happens to these birds after taking the wrong route. Some experts believe they just stay and die in Europe. Recent evidence, however, suggests that some find a mate that's made the same journey from America, and just create then new. settle in a suitable habitat on mainland Europe to nest and have chicks. There's also evidence... That I wonder if there's some sort of built-in navigation they have that, like, requires them to navigate between North and South America, and I wonder if they would lose that instinct, or if, if it's not in the right area of the world. I... I mean, you know, nature doesn't mean, doesn't care about happy endings, so it, it could just be, yeah, yep, yeah, you turn the wrong, you took the wrong turn and you die here. That some birds travel to Africa and get carried back to America by easterly winds. Oh, that's great. Whatever they do, they hardly ever stay long on the Isles of Scilly. Wrong they know turn. they haven't reached their correct or final destination. There's a good reason why it's bright and lush green. The prevailing westerly winds from the Atlantic guarantee moisture for rich plant growth pretty much all year round. One of the best woodlands in Ireland is at Glengariff near the southwest coast. Glengariff wood is typical of old deciduous woodland found in northwestern Europe. It has predominantly oak trees and the wet climate allows a wide range of ferns and mosses to grow. But amongst this growth, there are also rare and curious plants in this woodland. This is St. Patrick's cabbage. It's found only in the southwest of Ireland and western Portugal, and nowhere else in Europe. Why grow only in these two places? It's not as if they can choose to just get up and fly and migrate, so... I'm assuming it was probably more widespread and stretched from Portugal to Ireland, but over time it couldn't compete anywhere else but these two areas, and so they're only ones that remain, maybe. The same is true of another plant species growing nearby. This is kidney saxifrage, named for its kidney-shaped leaves. This plant is found only in southwestern Ireland, the Pyrenees, and the Cantabrian Mountains in Spain. Nobody knows for sure why two plants can live only in two areas of Europe. I'm a, like I said before, like, how else is a plant going to be only found in two areas very far away from each other and not in between? Like a bit in northern France and central France. It is in the Pyrenees. And then going northern Spain to Portugal. And I'd imagine they were probably just remnants. They're probably remnants of two plant species that were much more popular thousand, you know, however long ago and all across that range. And then it's just that Portugal and Ireland are the only places that have a less competition and suitable climate. That's my best guess. And which are so widely separated. Perhaps early settlers brought the plants with them from mainland Europe. Or that. They certainly weren't here 10,000 years ago. Virtually every plant and animal, including this wood mouse, living on the woodland's floor, made its way to Ireland after the last ice age. How and at what point different species colonized Ireland largely remains a mystery. 
Some were brought here by people. Some may have made their own way soon after the Ice Age, when land bridges may have existed between Britain and Ireland. Doggerland or something? Some were carried by the wind, or may have drifted here on the sea. We'll probably never know. But once isolated and established on an island, plants and animals often develop into forms that are special to a location. Like these red deer in Killarney National Park. They are the only true native red deer in Ireland. See, this is no, these guys are all over the place here. I see them all the time. And they've been here since the end of the last ice age. Although red deer are widespread throughout Europe, and there are other breeds of introduced red deer elsewhere in Ireland, these are special. They're pure native stock, and they very nearly became extinct here around 30 years ago. These are mothers with their young. The young deer are lying down and have a mottled coat. When they're hiding in dense undergrowth, they're impossible to spot. The adults seek added security by staying close to the edge of the trees. It's funny how you could just see it, see it swallow it. The adult. Do you guys, like, should we, br how do you guys feel about extinction of animals that are going, that don't seem to have gone extinct or close to extinction from human caused things like shouldn't you just let those things go extinct since i'm not saying this is an, an an inference but aren't you kind of messing with the whole kind of how life has worked forever if you're intervening on the natural extinction of a species shouldn't you like leave that alone and let it go extinct or am i wrong i don't mean it for like ones that were clearly made to go extinct from human activity, okay? But, yeah, so, yeah. Adults seek added security by staying close to the edge of the trees. Yep. At the first sign of danger, they'll retreat into the forest. Nasgilach. West of County Kerry, in the picturesque bay of Balin Skelligs, you'll find the Skelligs. It's a lot of birds. It would be difficult to find two islands so close to each other, and yet so unlike anywhere else in the world. Little Skellig, white and inhabited by birds. The island of Skellig Michael, hmm. green and inhabited by man for centuries. Oh. Monks began to colonize the island around 1,400 years ago. Though the monks have long left, their monastery has survived. It was perfect isolation for a harsh and committed life. I, I was confused at first, and I'm like, why aren't the birds landing on this one why are all of them on the other one and then you said inhabited by people and so maybe they're scared of them but it's been uninhabited for a while now and they're still not going and obviously uh repeated bird poop on the ground is probably gonna kill the grass though i think it's also good fertilizer isn't that what palau or naru made a lot of money and then lost it, it was perfect isolation for a harsh and committed life it's isolation, too, that the birds are seeking on Little Skellig. 30,000 pairs of gannets cover the entire island. It's one of the biggest gannet colonies in Europe. The birds' droppings give the island its white color. It's an ideal nesting location. No predators live on this rock, and the cliffs are too dangerous even for adventurous human beings. Any young bird will be safe from virtually all land invaders. What about 
predatory birds. It's also convenient for catching fish. Food is only a dip away from the island. Guys, isn't swimming just flying underwater? Like, to crabs, fish are flying. <laughs> I said this. Like, it's, a, it's the same concept, right? Swimming and flying. It's just in, you're in different mediums. So they're... Okay. The rock above the water isn't enough of a wonder. The 70 meters of rock that lies beneath the surface is also teeming with wildlife. Help, forest. There are forests of kelp, just as rich as any tropical forest. How tall can they get? There are thousands of anemones with many different colors. Anemone. Anemone. The majority are dahlia anemones. That looks poisonous. They'll eat just about anything that gets caught in the tentacles, including small fish and crabs. Starfish doesn't care. These are jewel anemones, similar to the ones we saw in the Channel Islands. Colonies of thousands of small animals, cohabiting and creating a colorful landscape. Animals, cohabiting, saw in the Channel Islands. Aren't these tasty? What is this called, an urch sea urchin? Like the orange guts in it aren't isn't it colonies of thousands of small animals cohabiting and creating a colorful landscape like dahlia anemones they're common along north atlantic coasts but their number here is unusually high there are also sea urchins and numerous starfish too it's a very rich sea life Starfish sort of creep me out. The sea is fertile partly because of the excrement of thousands of gannets that's continuously falling into the water. <laughs> it supplies plenty of food material for the animals living here. It's here also that the colder sea of the northern part of the Atlantic meets the warm Gulf Stream. When warm seas and strong currents combine, they provide an abundance of food for marine life. Seeing stuff like this makes who want to see what we haven't found in other parts of the ocean. No, I don't think there's a megalodon or any large, um, like, very active predator, right? I think, I think we've probably found all of those. But there's got to be a bunch of crazy stuff that, that we haven't seen. Probably very, maybe like sleeper shark type animals. And just stuff like this, honestly be cool to discover. On Ireland's Atlantic-facing coast, there's a constant battle between the sea and the land. This struggle has led to the formation of spectacular landscapes. The powerful waves eat away at the rocks to create perilous cliff faces. One of the most impressive in Ireland are the Cliffs of Moher in County Clare. Here the coast has been eroded away to create a series of majestic cliffs, Jeez. which rise to over 200 meters above sea level. Because the rock is relatively soft, the relentless action of the sea and the weather results in the formation of craggy rocks and cliff shelves, perfect nesting sites for seabirds. There are thousands of them here, going out to sea to catch fish and returning to their nests. These are fulmars, and these guillemots. It looks a precarious place to nest and lay eggs, but these birds all lay irregularly shaped eggs 
that don't easily roll off the narrow shelves. Above the cliffs on the thin grassland that lies on the rocks, there are choughs, a red-beaked and red-legged crow. It's a bird that likes well-cropped grass pasture, where it can easily probe its beak into the soft soil to find insect larvae. Though usually mountain specialists in the rest of Europe, in the British Isles and Ireland, they've adapted to live along western coasts. Ireland may not have a vast range of species or varied wildlife, but what it does have is a few natural wonders, wow. some of which are unique in Europe. What? This is the Borren in County Clare, a vast expanse of limestone rock covering 250 square kilometers. Long crevices break up the limestone. And in these gaps, plants grow. With strong winds constantly sweeping in from the sea, this is the only place where plant life can survive. It's also the only place where sufficient soil is found. Although it's a bleak location, 75% of Ireland's native plant species can be found here. Around 700 different species have been identified. What makes the Burren special is the coexistence of plants that normally live in very different climates. Take this flower, the white dryas mountain avon. It's an upland plant commonly found on the Alps and in the Arctic. Growing next to it are orchids that are equally happy in more southern parts of Europe. It's as if nature is signaling that Ireland is the border between the far north and the more southern, warmer parts of Europe. It's also a place where the effects of the last ice age are visible on the landscape. These little islands in Clue Bay, County Mayo, are Here's gravel that. and rock deposits left by glaciers as they thawed and flowed into the sea. According to local folklore, there are 365 islands, one for every day of the year. All along the Irish coast, there are many more islands. And because of their isolation, a few have become havens for wildlife. Inish Boffin, in County Donegal, is a sanctuary for a secretive but noisy bird. Hey, dude. It's a corn crake. Up. A male calling in his territory, a patch of rough ground covered with weeds and nettles. The land may look untidy, but this is exactly what he needs, a place to hide and nest. Only rarely do you see this bird. He'll keep himself well hidden. Is he but even the... secretive birds have to occasionally show themselves during the breeding season. He's flown all the way from Africa to nest here. The female is somewhere in the undergrowth, sitting on eggs. Corncrakes aren't particularly rare birds. They can be found throughout Europe during the summer. But the type of wild grassland they need has disappeared in most countries. In the far west of Europe, Inishboffin is one of only a few locations where you'll hear this call. Very unique call for a bird. The islander's way of life on Inishboffin hasn't changed for decades, nor has the nature of the land. Seems like a bunny paradise. This suits Rabbit. many different species of birds like lapwings and skylarks that struggle to find suitable habitats elsewhere on the mainland. This is what makes these remote places that face the Atlantic so special. On the next part of the journey, we'll explore the west coast of Scotland 
It's full of natural. I've already seen the first half of this next video here. Um, I'm gonna watch the second half as well. I'm really happy I found a channel that has really cool nature videos that I, I'm able to upload uh, my reactions to. And yeah, just cool. I love this sort of stuff. I have nothing really to say. Just I hope you enjoyed that with me. I'd appreciate any answers to any questions I had. If I had any, I'm sure I did. And I'll see you guys next time, all right? Bye, guys.